Another big hello and welcome to all our listeners in what is Series 1, Episode 3 of Asher Look, It's Irish History. I'm Noel Salmon and I'm joined again by the two lads, Kieran Dowdall. How are you doing? And Mr. Stephen Fraser. Hello, good to be back. Lads, what is the crack with you? Is that strange since we last spoke? <laughs> Packing up my beautiful city centre apartment to move to become a country squire. That's... Yes. Yes, how is the prep going for the little baba that's on the way, actually? Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, good. We uh, All my stuff is gone, all my guitars are gone. Uh, the pictures on the wall, Moses, if you see the few behind me, like, but mostly everything is gone. And it's kind of, it's turned me nice oh. apartment into a cavern from Little House on the Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. Well, <laughs> something to know for our listeners, okay, because probably not everybody that's listening here is going to be familiar with this. So the two lads, Kieran and Steo, are going to be daddy. So Kieran for the first time and Steo for the second time. Yeah. And both baby girls are due in April, lads, I have to say. Flawless coordination and execution from the both is on this. <laughs> There's every likelihood we were me and Steo were only saying it before we went on air. That like if if my wife goes a week over and his wife goes a week, you know, under or whatever, yeah, they'll be in the same hospital at the same time, and we can nip off for whiskeys. Oh my god, yeah. man, that is unreal. Yeah, yeah there'll be a snapper style point of Guinness in there somewhere. Come on, it's it it's fate. It's gonna happen. Oh, yeah. that is epic. Is Tell it a turkey us. or a baby? <laughs> it's a fine <laughs> turkey. <laughs> Tell a baby girl to goes. hold it, and I'll ply Steph full of spicy food and all the other good stuff. That's that is epic. I want in on that uh, wetting of the baby's head if it's going down. Oh, it's going down here, Kieran. We have to do it. Uh, no matter what happens, we have to set a date there. And Noel, yeah, you, you can be our honorary guest, and we can tell you all about Fat Ode. Absolutely love it. The miracle of creation, as Ned Flanders likes to call it, lads. He's having yeah. all to look forward to. Well, still for the second <laughs> time, Dodo for the force. Best of luck to you, son. And yeah, what's going on with you? Oh. Well, tell uh, me. Not, not much, lads. Just keeping the head down and warp. Few, few well, no, on the horizon. If, if you allow me to divulge some of Niall's, Niall has a wedding to which I am joint best man. And, uh, you know, I've been chipping away at your speech, but Niall, how's it going? You're, you're edging ever closer. You're uh, taking yeah. yourself off the market finally. Oh, stop. Yeah, there's, I know. There's going to be a lot of disappointed females out there. <laughs> Women everywhere devastated still is, yeah. is basically the story. Yeah, I know. I'm taking the big leap, man. Myself and Emma getting hitched in August. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to it, I think. Uh, very excited. Yeah. Um, a, lot, a lot of big adventures to look forward to. We're, we're heading to Costa Rica next month um, with my job, which, which would be exciting. And we've got your brother Stags in Ibiza in May, um, which is going to be a big one. <laughs> and, uh, and then, yeah. Wedding in August, all roads lead to that, and then and then a honeymoon in, in Miami and Mexico. So very, very, very much so. Looking Jealous. forward to my few adventures over the next few months. Yeah, this year is big. If if we survive this year, we'll be all right. Absolutely. It's Gabby Hayes big. Yeah. <laughs> and folks, in terms of getting back to Irish history, so for all our listeners out there, just to take stock of where we are, this is episode three, but we're going to change the narrative ever so slightly for this one episode four and episode five are effectively going to break up the episodes a little bit so episodes three and four is going to be based on irish life in the 1940s during the emergency i.e world war ii and then episode five is going to be based on irish life between the years of 1945 and 1949 so post world war ii and the impact on irish life in those post-war years Lots to get through in this episode, but a lot of fascinating pieces of unknown history to cover. I'm sure it's going to make for a list, an interesting listen to everyone logging in on Spotify and YouTube. And just in terms of what we're all going to cover, just a quick summary. Kieran's going to kick us off as per usual. He's going to talk about focusing on the members of the Nazi party working for the Irish state. He's going to talk a little bit about Nazi spies in Ireland and the dark but interesting topic of, of German bombs landing on Ireland, on Irish soil during World War II, which of course includes the bombing of the North Strand. So he's going to go into a little bit more detail on that. I'm going to talk a little bit about the various changes that happened within the Irish military itself in World War II. As most listeners will know, we did take a position of neutrality. But as well as that, I want to talk a little bit about some of the POWs who crash landed on Irish soil from both sides and speak then finally about the uh, the Irishmen who fought in World War II against the, against the Axis powers. And then Steele's going to finish off by focusing on a pretty horrifying scandal that engulfed the Catholic Church around that same period. And I don't, <laughs> no shortage of uh, Catholic Church related scandals floating about in those days, lads, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Every episode will have a new scandal in the Catholic Church going forward. Yeah. <laughs> it's literally yeah. the crack. Like, you know, you could literally do uh, an episode per decade just on scandals in the Catholic Church, not just in Ireland either, across the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Madness. Yeah. But 
I think um so lads, that's that's pretty much the crack. I think we've all agreed on the flow for today's session. So um I think Kieran, without further ado, you're gonna you're gonna kick us off. Thank you. Yeah, so like I'm gonna talk about the, the people who work for the Irish Free State and work for the Nazi Party. So one of the first people we're gonna look at is an old friend of ours from episode two. You may remember him, Mr. Fritz Brass, who played in the army band for the Germany Ireland football match in Daily Mount Park, which we won 5 2. Noel went across that with us last time. Yes, it did. That's- so, Fritz Brass, so he was the leader of the first army school of music. He'd been born in Hanover in 1875. He- Immigrate to Ireland in 1923. This was at the invitation of General McCatty. He was appointed due to being unable to find a potential Frenchman to lead the army band and wanting to avoid a British appointee for his reasons. So the search for an expert military musician chose the German for the post. He arrived on the 4th of March 1923. He was given a rank of full colonel in the Irish army, which was a big draw for him. He took up the position of force leader of the Army School of Music, Army Number no. 1 Band, and the director of the Military School of Music in Dublin. Well, so he had joined this before the Nazis came to power. And as we know, they came to power in 1923. Well, so in Ireland, there was a, a guy called Otto Bene. He was the leader of the Nazi Party in Britain and Ireland. He was responsible for recruiting Germans to the Nazi Party. And encouraged by Bene, the German community in Ireland set up their own branch of the Nazi Party Ostlander Organisation, I hope I've pronounced that right, in 1924. Now, Fritz Brass himself had joined the Nazi Party in 1922. He was elected chairman, though, when he requested permission from the Irish Army to lead the group, it had been clearly suggested to him he had to choose between the two. He chose, smartly, the army in his career, and he allowed Adolf Meyer, who we're going to discuss in a second, to assume that position. So it was one of his big parts in promoting Nazism in Ireland. Or <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's the right word. <laughs> Here, um, the, like, this is fascinating. Uh, like, I've never heard anything like this. This guy was responsible for recruiting other Nazis in Ireland. Is that right? Well, so this guy himself, Fritz Brass, he never really... He, he, I'm sure he would have talked to different German people living here and encouraged them to join. But it was this other guy, Otto Bene, who was, you know, he was the sort of catalyst. He was the driving force for yeah. recruiting people. But the, the next guy we're going to talk about, Adolf Mar, he was the guy who really kind of ramped this up. And are we talking big numbers? Like, like I suppose, yeah. orchestrated and kind of like... No, no, no. no. Oh, okay. It was very few. In reality, there's actually photos of them doing Nazi party rallies in Dublin City. Jesus. <clears throat> and it, oh. it, there's not that many of them. There's maybe 30 to 40. It's kind of... That's a relief. Yeah. So, but these were just pure German, Austrian sort of people who immigrated yeah. within sort of the 20s to the 30s sort of period. But Isn't like, that bad, though, that piece you mentioned about he's recruited into the Irish Armed Forces in 1923 and he's given the rank of colonel straight off the bat. Hmm. I mean, like... Well, Talk about a free pass, like, you know? Well, he'd been in the Prussian army, in the sort of the German army in World War I. Sure, he uh, had experience, yeah. So, yeah, like, it's almost like Messi joining, like, uh, League of Ireland club. He was like, like, the German army. Thomas Muller, <laughs> trying to both. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> like, probably had experience in World War I, had, had all this experience, and then well, he comes in with all of his tactics. Jesus, he's good, point him to Colonel. Well, do you know what it was? So, actually, what brought him in was he was a composer as well, and he, some of them, the, 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 the music, yeah, or Charmy uses now was composed by him and ah, uh, yeah but he, he had been in charge of mul- multiple kind of bands in the German army in World War One, and before that the Prussian army as they would have been at the time so he was well respected in, in musical circles and for army people but like I said he was appointed because they couldn't find the Frenchman and they, the only people they could find were British and at this stage there was still a very anti-British sentiment especially in the army so he was yep. picked kind of for, for, for that he wasn't British he composed some stuff and you know we had military experience but the other thing was he, he took part in a lot of these Nazi functions so like I was saying they, they had Nazi rallies mm. quite small a lot of people were kind of bemused by them um, different like Irish people would look and they'd kind of they kind of think it was funny but <laughs> the guy he immigrated with uh, Christian Swellswick I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right Swellswick or something Swellswick Swellswick I've heard about yeah, yeah. pronunciations I can never 
figure. So he actually was anti-Nazi. He mentioned some of Brass's activities to his superiors in the army. They in turn told G2, the Irish military intelligence unit. So what they, what he said was at least twice in early 1939, September 1939, so around the time of the outbreak of war, the Brass had borne papers in the boiler house of the School of Music and also in April 1940 at the funeral of a German diplomat, a guy called Robert Wenzel. He and Brass had wore their military uniforms and Brass had given the Nazi salute with the grave side. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. And besides these, like, the military intelligence file kept on Brass noted that he'd actually sent Hitler a birthday greeting in 1939 sent mm. it directly to the Reich Chancellery. But unfortunately, our Fritz, he wasn't long for this world. In 1940, he died after he, the day after he retired. He was interred in Mount Jerome Cemetery in Dublin, and the Irish number one army band played. Uh, the guy who succeeded him as Nazi Party leader, French Party leader, should I say, was a guy called Adolf Maher. Now, he was an Austrian archaeologist. He served as director of the National Museum of Ireland in the 1930s. So he arrived in 1927 to work as senior keeper of antiquities for the National Museum. Now, he was revolutionary as far as the National Museum went. He implemented the reorganization of the collections and otherwise kind of he brought order to the museum's holdings. The museum now at the moment holds five million artifacts. So you can imagine... Then it was probably in the region, maybe two million, a lot. And he actually brought a return to ar- active archaeological dig work after an interval of maybe decades, 20, 30 years. And like, he was really well respected. In 1934, Eamon Devler appointed him director of the museum. He was so impressed with his commitment to the job. He ended up writing him a personal check for one excavation project in Drimna that actually brought up huge ar- archaeological findings that are on yeah. display in Kildare Street in the Archaeological Museum. But he was elected the branch party leader in 1934. He held the post till around 1939. So when he took over, he set about building up the Nazi party in Ireland. And 23 Germans were recruited to the party in his tenure, and he tried to recruit numerous other Irish people to the party. So these would have been students who may have been right wing leaning um different kind of people like that people within his own circles he tried to bring them in and he was described as using bully boy tactics so prospective members were given the choice of either joining the party or leaving Ireland not nothing else no. any visiting German or Austrian was going to report to Mar or their face being reprimanded was returning home Right. And such was the power he had, the two German diplomats were sent back to Germany for not towing the party line. He worked closely with the German legation of Dr. Edward Hempel, Hans Bowden, and SS officer Henry Thompson. An wow. SS officer based in Dublin. Yeah. Wow. He'd come from Norway and he'd been, he was a Norwegian and he had, he had basically, once the, the German of, um, invaded Norway and stuff, he, was one of the people who they kind of thought was good to work with and they sent him off to Ireland, which for him was probably a cushy post, really, you know? Wow. Yeah. They were based in Northumberland Road and they there was a lot of intrigue in, into what they were doing. So like they replied they supplied Mark with the reports and the comings and goings of all German or national. But here's one of the more controversial parts. Adolf Mar helped compile a database of names and addresses of Irish Jews, some Four thousand. Jesus. Who were earmarked for extermination in the minutes of the Wansey conference. Holy God. The Jewish community in Ireland is relatively small in comparison to uh, a lot of other religions, but it's still it's a it's a, it's a tribal community more so back then. Yeah, well, and Brassel Street in Dublin would have been a, a, a Jewish hub, mini Jerusalem, they called it. Wow. My mom was only telling me a story about that. Like, in, for like, I was obviously talking to my mom and dad about, you know, we're, we're, this this weekend we're going to be doing the podcast 1940s. And then, and somehow the conversation drifted towards there was Jewish people that saw the writing on the wall before the war and then during the war that that did come to Ireland mm. and um, a lot of them owned shops and actually my man did bring up the Monto shops in around the Monto but Jesus that is just uh, they were f- from Ireland it's crazy how the hive mind you know was it worked that deep and it was that organised and orchestrated even from Ireland it's 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 chilling as far as the Jews went they put a lot of time and thought into what's going to happen when we take over Every country in Europe, you know, they, they had that belief. Jesus. That this was going to happen. And like I said, this, the one C conference, you know, was where they decided the final solution, as they called it, for the Jewish race. And 
the fact that they were factoring in Ireland in these numbers of who, how many they had to exterminate, as they put it, is shocking. It really yeah. is shocking. You yeah. know, and for me, I actually found recently that Oh, yeah, actually, going back a good few generations have Jewish ancestry. And oh. for me, it's a, it brought it, it brought it to a fore. And we're always going, holy crap, you know, whereas before, maybe it was I was kind of removed from it. And I thought, well, you know, those are people that are in my bloodline. And well, that was me, you know, and it is wow. frightening. But this, here's the other thing. So this guy, Olaf Meyer, he was supplying maps to the SS. And there was a letter found in his papers after he left Ireland. We'll talk about that in a second. Thanking him for his help supplying maps again. We'll be looking at the invasion. Well, as head of the party in Ireland, he represented the Irish Nazi party at the coronation of George VI in 1947, along with Jochen Ribbentrop, again, a huge person within the Nazi regime. But by the time 1949 came around, Mar was feeling the pressure. He's being shadowed by the Guard of Special Branch, and as we mentioned, G2, the military intelligence branch. So he left Ireland to go to an archaeology conference in Berlin and to visit his family in Austria in September 1949. He happened to be kept with Nazi Germany at the outbreak of the war and he couldn't return to his directorship so he ended up taking a leave of absence. In this time, he was given a job as head of Ireland Redaction, so it was a propaganda radio station. He was given the job of coordinating propaganda broadcasts to Ireland. His decision now was to shift broadcasts away from the Irish language and to focus on propaganda efforts on anti-imperialism and petition pro-neutrality. But such such was his skill at the job, he was appointed head to Rue 9, Rue 2 uh, stations, which dealt with the broadcast of Britain, Ireland, and British Empire as a whole. Much of Mara's experience in Ireland ceased to be significant to the war effort as it became steadily more apparent that Ireland would not be invaded. So after the war, he was interred by the Allies. He saw a return to his directorship, and the Taoiseach was originally in favour, given his achievements with the National Museum. But there was opposition from Ireland's head of military intelligence, G2, and the TD, James Dillon. In the end, Mar left, was left in Germany, should I say, but given some pension from the Irish state, and he earned some income from occasional. He ended up dying of heart failure and bond while preparing for a new job on the 27th of May 1951. So the guy who took over from him was Heinz Mecklen. He was an advisor to the Turf Development Board, what we know today as Bard Namona. So Mecklen was the only person who was a member of the Nazi party before becoming He had joined the Nazi party in 1941. As I said, they didn't come to power in Germany until 1933. He ended up joining the Turf Board in 1936. His success you now with the Turf Board was questioned. Some advice on drainage proven to be but he was an active Nazi, being leader of the German Labour Front in Ireland, attending Nazi conferences abroad. He succeeded Marr as branch party leader um, in June 1939, but then only held it till September 30. His residence in Beechwood Road in Renola, a very nice, very nice road to live on now these days, uh, was used for Nazi party meetings and was put under surveillance. Mechelen left with other Germans of military age in 1939. He joined the German army during the war, he was put in charge of the turf production, he was captured by the Red Army and died of starvation in a POW camp in Moldova. What strikes me is the failure of Mar and the Nazi party to, like, I believe his goal was to at least recruit Irish people to the cause and to, yeah. they, they very clearly tried to uh, customise their ideology towards, you know, bringing the Irish people people along to their way of thinking. But I'm just, I suppose I'm glad and I'm probably a little bit surprised that they're, it, like their their sheer failure to do that, that really becomes apparent to me. Am I being crazy or is that no. like, they, it's almost like they were, came over here really organized with their Nazi ideology and they really failed to kind of bring people on board. Well, no, so. There was a a more of a, um, a leaning towards the Germans and Nazism at the outbreak of war. For a lot of people, the 1920s, 20 years ago. So, you know, for, for us now, imagine, you know, the, around the early 2000s, 9-11 is not long to us. Yeah, yeah. So there was an anti-British sentiment to so a lot of people. It was a great trade. Eamon McTomas in uh, some of his books talks about the trade in Nazi badges that was going on in Ireland. No way. Hmm. We're in some ways more sympathetic to the Nazis, to the Germans, because they'd helped us, obviously. You heard 
in the 1916 proclamation, the 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 line "Our gallant allies in Europe" is referring to the Germans. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. For them, for the Irish people at the time, they had very little hatred for the Nazis. The Holocaust, the bad things that happened weren't public knowledge. What they knew about was the Germans helped us in 1916. Yeah. But they had, as we talked about in the last episode, they had brought their country leaps and bounds ahead of the rest of Europe during the Great Depression. Things were going well there. So, And you know what's an important point on that as well? Nazis arriving in Ireland, or German Nazis arriving in Ireland, was a byproduct of the Irish state seeking help from overseas that wasn't British to build up. Ah. You like, you, you on touched on two points already. He spoke about the expertise of the archaeologists they brought in. He completely yeah. transformed the museum's operations. He spoke about the composer coming in for the Irish military. They still use his songs today. And I think Kieran's going to touch on it in a short bit as well. The Yard and the Crusher power station built um, down in Shannon. Yeah, they yeah. brought in German engineers to build that. Mm. Uh, and because of that German influence, and we all know that the Germans are unbelievable engineers. I think all of these Nazis that appeared in Irish life and Irish society was a byproduct of Ireland bringing skilled individuals here from Germany. Mm. They weren't English. They were German. So yeah. I think that's... Again, just to reiterate, a, a kind of a byproduct of, of bringing yeah. skilled, well, uh, experienced you know, people from that country over here. Yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah, definitely. And but I think with that, I'm just I'm a little bit surprised that Ireland weren't kind of enamoured by these people, these these exotic foreigners who were brought in for their skill. I, I, like I'm a little based on what Kieran is telling me. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that they didn't like have more people at these Nazi rallies. Is what I'm kind of saying. They, they had people watching. You know, your ordinary people in the street would have watched, and I'm sure some of them would have given the Nazi salute. You know, more out of you know just the crack of it, really. You know, without yeah. understanding the true politics. It only be yeah. apparent as 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 the war progressed what the Nazi really entailed. But yeah. I'll, I'll uh, push back further with that and say, do you think? And what I'm kind of like getting from this is that I'm still thinking uh, I'm still surprised that there wasn't more uptake in the Nazi movement in Ireland. It seems as though it was almost like when you say like 37 people turned up, I'm like, Jesus, that's very low. But like, I still think maybe perhaps that the World War One, you know, in the Treaty of Versailles, they had to Germany were seen and they were branded as the bad guys. And probably rightly so for the outbreak of World War One. So it seems to me that there was still that little bit of suspicion of, you know, kind of watch these guys. Yeah, I think, That's I, think getting... another, I think another important point on that, though, is World War One and World War Two are very different in the sense that World War Two was all about Nazism and Nazi ideology. And, yeah. you know, Irish people probably saw these, as you saw, as you call them, mystic foreigners coming over. But like na- Nazi ideology, Irish people would not agree with that. Inherently, they just wouldn't, you know, the, no. like the massacre of the Jewish race. There's no Irish person that would agree with that unless they're an actual Nazi themselves. And they probably would have seen it as some strange cult, you know, they probably just said, well, hang on a minute, that's not for me, you know. Well, um, is, like in, in, in one way, as, as the war progressed, they did see it. So in, going back to what Ian McMoss says in his books. So when the news of the, 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 the massacres that were, were, were being carried out by the Germans, the, the extermination of the Jews, People turned immediately against them, you know, people who had yeah. worn the Nazi badge as a sign to be, I'm anti-British, you know, yes. pro-Nazi. They actually went to, to, to bridges all over Dublin and threw the Nazi badges into the rivers. And today, I guarantee if you went to some of those rivers with a metal detector, you would find these Nazi badges where people wow. were, no, it's incredible to think, isn't no, it? it's not for me. Again, it was anti-British more than anti-Nazi. There was another guy, Friedrich Weckler. He was the chief accountant for the ESB. He came to Ireland in 1926 to work on the, as I was earlier, the Shannon Hydroelectric plant. He yeah, Arden the Crusher. Yeah, Arden the Crusher, exactly. He yeah. joined the Nazi party in 1924. And like Ryan Harden Marr, 
He was monitored by the Guard Special Branch in G2 due to his attempts at the Kilmacora Park Hotel functions. But he was one of the few Nazis who remained in Ireland when war broke out. The G2 files state that he believed to be taking part in signaling activities in his darky home. So the house on Fico Road, again, one of the very plush roads in the country. Like, <laughs> you live there, you are rich. But we've put in the surveillance in uh, October and November 1940, but they noticed a signal lamp being used in the Guard and to send out a code so, so it was coming but they couldn't tell what it was but they couldn't link it to Weckler I, I found strange in reading because it was like when oh, you were surveillance them you could see a light did nobody go and try and arrest them or do anything it's something I found quite strange mad uh, and, and here's the funny thing though coincidentally another house on the same road routinely left their lights on at night to help guide German bombers but look all of this didn't really affect him he rose in the SB he became company secretary so essentially one of the top people in the company but he died in 1943 now so these were the guys who were working for the state but there was also spies within Ireland so one of the main ones was Herman Gors so he was an intelligence officer in the military intelligence section at work sent to Ireland in 1940 to liaison with the IRA about possible cooperation on an attack on the British ruled Northern Ireland so he had a history of spying working with a female accomplice uh, a lady Marianne Emig he tried Travelled through England in the 40s, gathering information on army bases, uh, but during the absence in Germany in October 1945, his rented house in the Broadstairs in Kent was raided. Drawings of RAF Manston and other compromising material was uncovered. And on his return, it was in November, he was arrested. March 1946, he was sentenced to four years for espionage, served a sentence of Brixton and Madison jails. He was released and deported in February 1949, Germany, obviously. But in 1940, in the summer, Gorge parachuted into Balliver County. He made in an effort to gather information. His mission was to act as a liaison officer with the IRA to enlist their help during any potential German occupation of Britain. However, he soon decided the IRA was too unreliable. They were too amateurish in his opinion. But on landing, he lost his transmitter. It was called an UFA transmitter. He had partially illuminated. And here's the great thing. So he was dressed in his Luftwaffe outfit. He walked to Dublin. He wasn't apprehended. Boy, called into a guard of Arkson County Wicklow to ask for directions to Dublin. Wow. Gorgeous. That is unbelievable. Yeah, you think so. Some showing up in a Luftwaffe outfit might, you know, raise some suspicion, but <laughs> evidently not in 1940. The guards just, oh, yeah, it's uh, down the road there to the right. <laughs> Four hours walk that way <laughs> so he ended up staying in, in, in a lot of safe houses so uh, Temple Oak and other places but he was at Liberty for 19 months so he stayed in a Temple Oak Glenagiri Dunleary Docky Ramoy Shaquille Brittis Lara Castle in Glendalock Fennett uh, County Kerry County Cavan all the lovely spots I was going to say that yeah like <laughs> it's, it was one of the things that really struck me it was like there was nobody staying in Kulak or anywhere like that oh stop yeah. Well, so he was on the run. Main <laughs> the guard raided the home of an IRA member of German descent, a guy called Stephen Carroll Held. And he'd been working with Gortz out of his house in Blackheath and Clontarf, again, knowing area of the country. They confiscated parachute uh, papers, got World War I medals, number of documents about the defense infrastructure in Ireland. The papers they took included files on possible military targets, such as airfields and harbors, as well as details of Plan Kathleen. This was an IRA plan for the invasion of the north of Ireland to support the Nazi military intelligence. Scott, now he, at this time, oh, so he went into hiding, he was staying with sympathizers in Wicklow, and he avoided contact with the IRA and the IRA safe houses. So he remained at large for 18 months. There was an IRA member called Pierce Paul Kelly. He visited Gorch's hiding place in Dublin in November 41, and police ended up arresting them both. Gorch, he was interned in Mount Joy, then Custom Barracks in Athlone, and he was released at the end of the war. Lived in Glenagiri, then he became secretary, saved the German Children's Society, and he was rearrested the following year and served a sentence. So to prevent deportation, he claimed to have been an SS officer rattling in the Luftwaffe. The G2 were able to disprove this claim. On Friday, the 23rd of May 1947, he arrived at the aliens office in Dublin Castle. At 9.50 a.m., he was told he was being deported to Germany the next day. And although it was stated by the Irish government, that they specifically requested he was not handed to the Soviets, he decided to commit suicide. So the Irish Times the next day reports on this, so it said, he stared disbelievingly at the detective officers, then suddenly he took his hand from his trouser pocket, swiftly removed his pipe, 
from between his lips, slipped the glass foil into his mouth. When the police officer sprang at Gortz as he crunched the glass within his teeth, the officer got his hands around Gortz's neck, but failed to prevent most of the poison leading to prussic acid from passing down his throat. Within a few seconds, Gortz collapsed dead. He was driven to uh, Mercer's Hospital, now near Stevens Green, and he was pronounced dead shortly afterwards. Gortz was buried three days later in a Dublin cemetery. So the funeral was attended by Dan Brain, Famous Dan Brain, as we talked about before. Yes, in 1974, his remains were removed to the German military cemetery in Glen Creek, County Wicklow. One of Ireland's hidden parts. A lot of people know about a military cemetery in the middle of probably the most idyllic part of Ireland. Yeah. yeah. But, so he wasn't the only one. There was another guy, Gunter Schultz. So he walked again for the Abwehr. He was deployed to Ireland. However, he was parachuted into the completely wrong location. He was immediately apprehended by the Irish police and spent most of the war in prison. Brief period on the run after escaping prison. When he parachuted in, he was given a thousand pounds sterling and three thousand two hundred US dollars, some of which was counterfeit. The Abwehr made it clear to show he was not to contact the Euro for any reason. The forced uh, opportunity to deposit in Ireland failed when he was forced to return to Amsterdam on the 5th of March 1941. The second attempt a week later was successful. The plan drop zone was Newbridge near Dublin, but in fact he was dropped a hundred miles off in County Wexford. Fortunately for him, he was spotted by the Garda. He was placed under arrest. He immediately confessed everything to the police and was taken to Arbor Hill Prison on the 15th of March 41. During his interrogation by G2, he was told about German agent Willem Breitz and Walter Simon, who had also been caught. Well, due to the lack of knowledge he had, he was entirely un- Schultz was to make a few efforts to escape from captivity involved in listening to help with the IRA through an attorney a guy called Jim O'Hanlon Schultz made his escape attempt the 15th of February 42 the end of breach in the home of Jim's brother Joe from this point he was sheltered and protected by the IRA forced by the O'Hanlons then by Caitlin Brewer in Ratmoyers Brewer wanted Schultz to re-establish contact with the Abwehr facilitate resupply of arms and ammunition to the IRA through Mrs Brewer con- contacts uh, Schultz met with representatives of the Northern Group, the Belfast IRA, who explained to Schultz that they had a plan. He wanted communications equipment, arms, ammunition, and money to rebuild the IRA. In exchange, they'd arranged for Schultz to leave Ireland, arrive in occupied France. His departure then was uh, planned for the 30th of April 42. The house where Schultz was staying was raided, and Schultz was taken into custody by the Irish Special Branch. Schultz was returned to Arbor Hill, was room which once, funnily enough, had housed Eamon de Valera, the Taoiseach at the time, and it had a carpet and a radio, so it was quite Nice compared to what most Irish prisoners were dealing with. He said that to remain in the war in prison, he was put on the list for deportation after the war. He married an Irish citizen, a lady called Una Mackey, on the 1st of May 47. He appeared at the alien's office on the same day as Herman Gorse committed suicide. And following this, was flown from Ballon to Frankfurt, taken to a uh, US irrigation centre. He was released soon after. He successfully established his own import export business and eventually moved back to Ireland in the 60s. He ended up running a hotel in County Wicklow, retired to a home in Avoca, and died in a sleep in Shank Hill in 1991 wow lived a lived a full life in Ireland yeah yeah and there was there was, a, there was other people who didn't leave in 1939 and kept out the Nazi party way but would have under Mar probably shown some sympathy in reality but so there we have the Nazis who walked here the, the Nazis who were dropped here to spy but what was what was the effect on the war on the ordinary people so one of the big things was the bombing of Ireland during World War II was quite a lot just to give you a brief summary before we talk about the main bomb that happened in the North Strand so the first one was on the 26th of August 1940 five German bombs were dropped on County Wexford it was in a daylight raid when hit the Shelbourne Cooperative Premier in Camp Oil this killed three people in 1943 the German the government will pay nine grand in compensation, roughly about half a million today's money. The next is in 1940, the 20th of December, at half seven in the evening, two bombs fell on Glastil near Dunleary. In wow. Jersey. A third bomb fell about half an hour later near Cargan Cross, in the centre of Cargan Cross, slowly injuring one person. Both for the second, the January 41, bombs fell in Mead, Carlow, Kildare, Wicklow, Wexford, and Dublin. So in Mead, five bombs fell in Dalik, three at Julian Sound, no casualties. In Carlow, a house in Knock Row was destroyed, killing three people and injuring two others. Jesus. Ellen, Bridget, and Cathy Shannon were killed. Yeah, three, the one family. 
There are three high explosives, as well as many incendiary bombs fell in the Cora camp area. Two sea mines were dropped by parachute near Anaskari and Wicklow. Ballymoran and Wexford was saw three German bombs falling. Again, no casualties. Oh, Ballymoran, uh, me, me missus is good friends are from down in that village. Oh, yes. Yeah, Shout out to them. Hello. Shout out to uh, Eileen and Shane, if you're listening in. All the way down in Ballymoran. Wow. The next one. So in Dublin, then, it, there was a German bombs hit Terranure. Two fell in at Ratdown Park. Another two fell at Forfield Road in Laverne and Grove. There were injuries, but no loss of life. These fell on housing states that were being built. So luckily enough, nobody was killed, but it could have been much worse. Uh, Dublin then was hit again in January 3rd, 1941. The Luftwaffe bombs dropped on the North Harrison, the South Circular Road. 20 people were injured there's no loss of life but one of the things they did hit was the mosque uh, which is now a mosque on South Sacred Rose at the time was a synagogue and it was one of the few times uh. the Jewish synagogue where they destroyed the windows but as anyone who knows the South Sacred Road where the mosque is it still stands today yep most fatal ha- happened on the 21st of May 1941 the Whit Weekend it's called four German bombs fell in North Dublin in the North Strand area killing 28 people that night a large number of German planes were spotted in Irish skies searchlights were pulled up to track them down it was noted that the planes were not flying in formation but independently in a meandering way and some appeared to be circling Sean they were either lost or wasn't a planned bombing run, as far as I so after the German planes didn't clear Irish airspace, continued erratically flying over the sea, the Irish Ar- Army fired warning flares, starting with three flares representing the colours of the Irish flag, obviously green, white and orange, to inform the pilots they were over neutral territory, followed by several red flares warning them to clear Irish airspace on fire them. After 15 minutes, the order was given to open fire, and the aircraft guns began to fire at the bombers. Local air defences were weak, the gunners poorly trained, and they had sh- shells capable of destroying the aircraft, they failed to hit any of their targets. The bombers continued flying over the city, while being fired on for almost an hour, and Dublin people were watching this, was a spe- spectacle for them, this was entertainment. When the bomb fell in the city, the North Circular Road, the first one that happened at 1.28 a.m., Demolished two houses of 43 and 44 Summit Hill Park. Injured many. There was no loss of life though. Followed immediately by another bomb in Middle Air on the Ballybock Road. It's caused much damage. Again, thankfully no loss of life. The third bomb actually fell two minutes later in the Phoenix Park with Dog Pond pumping works near the zoo. No casualties, but a damaged arse on Ukraine, the House of President, Douglas Hyde, at the time. The bomb startled many of the animals, actually causing the elephant to escape its <laughs> enclosure and ended up being found hiding in the reeds of the lake. And one of the, the biggest things that could have gone wrong was there was a huge bison that attempted to escape after the bomb and it kept hitting itself off the railings and ended up smashing the railings eventually. It could have gotten out and been quite dangerous to see, but hitting the railings knocked it out and it happened to be stunned and was able to be taken care of, you know. But after this, some of the German planes, they left Irish airs. A couple of others remained. Anti-aircraft guns, they ceased to fire. But one of the German aircrafts, it was fired on by guns over Collinstown, which is now an airport, and they ended up turning around and soon appeared over Dublin. They began circling the sea, swooping lower and lower. So the anti-aircraft guns they again engaged the plane the plane continued making aerial maneuvers over the city for close to half an hour dodging anti-aircraft shells and the searchlight beams dropping the bomb landed at 2.05 a.m killing 28 people 90 people were injured and approximately 300 houses were destroyed or damaged and 400 were left home so there was one entire family wiped out this is of the north strand bomb this is the saddest part so a member of the local defense force the ldf uh he's based in star street uh harry brown he was on patrol with his colleagues when the force bombs fell now whether the patrol had finished their duties or he feared for the sake of his family uh, is yet to be figured out brown returned to his home at number 25 north strand road in the early hours of the morning he had just reached his door when the fort bomb fell believed to be all of 500 pounds and it landed on the ground in front of his house so brown he was killed immediately as was the 65 year old mother mary his wife mary or molly if she was now she's 42 her children maureen seven and five Edward 3, Angela 2. Very sad. Three, Devastating loss of life. Just snuffed out in a moment, you know. Yeah. The people who would have come from that, that, that family. I mean, that's the end. Yeah, very sad. Uh, survived by no one. Yeah, yeah and, and that's, he was, he, his when his body was found, Harry Brown himself, it was found with his hand grasping the door. So it seems he had just reached the front door when the bomb hit, you know. The bomb fell. Crazy. Yeah. 
And that, like I said, the whole three generations. What's a couple of couple of comments on on, on the North Strand bombing? And I, I said if he is off air, I spoke to my uncle John Kenny. Shout out to John. He gave me a lot of intel about this podcast, actually. But his mother is over a hundred years of age. She's still going on a bother on her, and um, oh. she is from a ten- tenement building. She grew up in a tenement building, um, in and around uh, kind of Sheriff Street area. So remembers it distinctly. Remembers two two distinct elements about that bombing was two of the factories that were hit and one of the factories was the the Shivers Jelly Factory you know mm. the brand mm. um, and yeah. another one was, was the Board's Custard Factory and one thing that John's mother said she has a distinctive memory of is the liquefied jelly rolling down the streets in all Whoa. different colours yeah Whoa. from that factory getting hit and and seemingly now John wasn't 100% on this but again this is kind of second hand information from his mother who was alive at the time and is still alive today to tell the story mm. wow um, in the in the board's custard factory whatever material was in the air seemingly it set it set a light because there was a fire close by it, it, it ignited something in the atmosphere because the atmosphere was heated from the bombs or whatever and the whole place just went up in flames. Something to do with the egg powder igniting based on the explosive from the fire or something like that. So wow. Yeah. Really, really devastating loss of life. But yeah, just to just to hear kind of kind of secondhand information passed on on on, on her memories from that incident from that is just incredible. And and there was just one final comment I wanted to make on that as well, Kieran. I, I I'm I members of a Facebook page which gives information about um the Irish Air Corps, you know, aircraft, historical moments, etc. And only only 13 days ago, a guy called Noel Fitzgerald of Dawkey passed away 104 years of age, apparently one of the last remaining survivors of the North Strand bombing. He was about 21 at the time. Wow. So the fact that that was still in living memory only up until a few weeks ago is... Uh, well, it's still is. So my granddad now yeah. lived on Clarence Street, which is a couple of streets away from the bombing. But again, yeah. quite damage. And he remembers there being flash of light and then a bang and remembers everything going crazy. His parents coming in screaming, get out of the house, you know, yeah. and like the fear and everything. And he remembers it now. He's in his, his late 80s now. But again, he remembers this. There are people again, quite young yeah. who remember it as well. You yeah, know? it's unbelievable. And, and again, my, my, my uncle's mother still still going strong, 100 and something years of age, remembers it as a child. Wow. Um, uh, or even a teenager, potentially, like so. I suppose does it all tie in? It's it's easy for me to speculate, but I I think this could touch on it. I think I'd like to raise when I get to my section. You know what does this type of aerial threat? I mean, it's 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 quite consistent. You have to raise in about six or seven separate incidents of bombings or potential bombings. Um, yeah. And what does that have on a psyche of a country, <clears throat> even though we're meant to be neutral and had nothing to do with it? Yeah. I mean, let's just take our own living experience. I was, when we were like, I can remember 1993, like being on holidays in Wexford with my brother and being petrified that we were going to be in an IRA bomb. And I know it, it, it's silly. There was no chance of that. Even one bomb, Kieran's after naming six examples, but even one bomb, knowing that we're so close to this, like so close to a country involved in a war and oopsie, like we've gone too far. What it does to the psyche of a country, like the, the fear it must have put through everybody, especially those living in Dublin because of the proximity towards Great Britain. But yeah, it's a, my uh, granddad, Fraser, who, you know, wouldn't have lived a million miles from North Strand and Bath Avenue there, in, not too far from Ring's End, Stone Stroke from Ring's End, really. He, he remembers seeing the Spitfire chasing the Luftwaffe and seeing planes consistently over that time because they were there at that time. But like I think it does. Does it have relevancy towards you know some of the scandals that we've seen? Oh, you yeah. know, probably. The final part, then, just to touch on, was the bomb shelters in Dublin. And this is my favourite story. So in the previous months, these been used as a dark corner for dating couples, for toilets, and used as a shelter for homeless people. When the bombs hit the shelters, couldn't be opened due to the keys being lost. Jesus. When told to enter the shelters, many people were looking to go as the shelters were dark, airless, and smelly. Most of the men protested, refused to get into the shelter does instead preferring to go into the local pubs that weren't destroyed and demanding a drink due to the 
Yeah, that's, that's it. I think we'd all be the same, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, that's all yeah. total against them. But like due to the commotion going on, a lot of the public and they offer drinks on the slate, you know, on, on tick basically, leading to some of the lads taking advantage, you know, fellas who couldn't afford a half point of Guinness ordering a quadruple malt whiskey, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but the shelters, the women and children are terrified for certain rosaries and praying that they go again, airless, smelly, damp shelters awful things the people were choking afraid they'd die for the airlessness inside there were some heroes the police the air raiding wardens the army the St. John Ambulance the Order of Malta they walked for days extracting survivors and dead bodies from the rubble they walked well above and beyond the normal capabilities they saved many more lives than would have been done and the gas at the time which was rationed during the war Francis O'Brien he was a gas company inspector better known to the Irish public as the Glimmer Man whose job was to catch anyone who was used next to Steven Seagal oh the, yeah the <laughs> they call him the Glimmer Man uh, but as you can imagine that particularly well liked role in the North Strand or other areas so like if he was spotted like and would to go around neighbours would turn off the gas but Francis' knowledge of gas lines came in extremely handy the night the bomb went off the site was incredibly dangerous place for the victims and the rescue walkers as they were surrounded with live wires tram cables and escaping gas many fires in the area fire fires they tried to tame the flames while volunteers searched for the gas leak the bomb had blown a huge 12 inch gas main thinking quickly Francis O'Brien pulled a match to the gas leak which created an ordinary flame to burn the gas coming out saved the area from a further explosion so clothes precious family possessions foods they were all, everything was destroyed in some cases victims lost their livelihoods their businesses were demolished donations were made throughout the city East press and many people did respond generously fundraised events were held and there are many accounts of tenement dwellers who were left destitute being looked after they didn't have much in the first place in the compensation terms unfortunately did exclude many of them so on the 5th of june de valera and members of his cabinet attended a mass funeral for 12 of the victims later that day he informed dollar that an official protest had been delivered to edward temple from the german legation and they've been registered with berlin as well so it was interpreted as a navigation error by the germans Cited by Churchill as an example of the British signals jamming known as the Battle of the Beams. It was also interpreted as a simple accident or a best of a shot across the belt to remind the neutral Irish state of the destruction and carnage that awaited them, should the government opt to go to war with the Nazis. But after the war, the West German government paid the compensation to the government about using Marshall Plan money. This money had gone on to build the Ballymore Flats, another travesty for Ireland. <laughs> but there was two <laughs> of German bombings. So in Arklo, the 4th of June 41, there was a couple of bombs there was no casualties and in the 24th of July 41 bombs fell in the dark causing small damage but no casualty well brilliant lads fascinating insights all around and just wanted to say a big thanks to all our listeners uh, for listening in please continue to like and subscribe listen to us on YouTube and Spotify and um, we've just wrapped up episode 3 and um, please tune in next week um, when we're going to get into episode 4 uh, looking forward to speaking thanks a lot take care